welcome to the front of the room, Mr. Andy Speed. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I got a clicker? You do. All right. It's right here. Are you on? I think I'm on. Yeah, you're on. Okay. Well, it's great to be here, everybody. We are going to talk about tonight uh, a very interesting aspect of creative financing, right? And that aspect of creative financing is absolutely positively something that I believe that every real estate investor should have in their pocket. Not some real estate investors, literally every real estate investor. So um, just a little bit about kind of me. I've been in the space a long time. I've been doing this 40 years. This is my 40th year in the business. I started in 1980. I started at a, a little note buying company in Hattiesburg, Mississippi in 1980. I've lived in Dallas-Fort Worth, my wife and I, since 1982. And I've closed 40,000 notes. So I've been around the space a long time. I'm honored to do that. I would say that one thing that I think means a lot to me is this is a little uh, child welfare board in a little county in Texas and note schools family, not Eddie Speed personally, but note schools family has given over $700,000 to this charity. And these are kids that are in foster care because their parents make bad choices and end up in prison because they're making dope and the kids end up without a life and can't buy a prom dress or a, a laptop. And so we just have kind of fostered this little end of the world. We have been able to help some other things, but I'm honored that that's kind of who Note School is as a family as, and as people that do it. So, um, so I started in 1980 and about 1986 or seven, you forget these things over time. I met a guy named Ken D'Angelo. His brother had a real estate investing company in Dallas-Fort Worth, and he had owner financed some properties and was wanting to sell the notes. So, so Ken D'Angelo uh, then later called me and said, hey, my brother John and I aren't doing our real estate investing. I've broke off, and I'm going to do something different, and I'm going to build a franchise, and we're going to franchise the house buying business. And of course, people thought he was crazy, and long story short, so uh, I developed the note system for home investors in, 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 literally in 1992. And of course, I'd worked and bought all the home investor franchise notes for years. I don't currently have a relationship with them, but I've taught more brand name, high volume guys to, to create seller financing way by far than anybody in the country. So that's kind of a, a trademark and something that we've done. And we are going to talk about creating seller financing tonight, but it's going to be a much different angle than a lot of people think of it. So um, every real estate investor can do this, right? Uh, there's two things about it. First of all, when, and I would say within the first day. I'm going to show you, by the time you come to a class on Saturday, you're going to look at yourself at the end of the day and say, I just walked by a deal last week. I just walked by a deal a week ago that I could have applied this to had I been able to do it. So it's not like this is so random you won't find a deal. You literally will find deals that you passed and you'll be able to apply this, this immediately. And secondly, where can you do it? And the deals are simply in your trash can. They're the people that that didn't do business with you because they were stuck on price and you were stuck on price, right? Price means nothing to me. Price is irrelevant. Is he crazy? Did he say that? Did he say price doesn't matter? Price doesn't matter if you know how to structure terms, right? Price doesn't matter if you know how to structure terms. So one vantage point I have that's very unique is I've looked at more seller finance transactions than anybody in the United States, three to 400,000. So I've seen about every crazy way in the world you can structure a deal. And somewhere in this mind, I have seen all these different deals structured and I've developed training. And yes, I do probably train 200 of the top 500 real estate investors across the country in one specific aspect of their business, which is how to structure seller financing. Now you may say, well, I'm not the 100 house a year plus guy that Eddie trains. So this is going to be over my head. Let me, tell you, let me tell you something that's absolutely true. If you did five deals last year, if you did 10 deals last year, you probably, know, you probably at the same starting point of a guy that bought 200 houses last year 
and didn't use creative financing, right? They may be way up the scale in their wholesaling business, but this business is a whole new game for everybody. So I'm gonna show you some case studies tonight. We'll just kind of work through them and talk about what that looks like. And the last thing is, how do you do it? And I'm gonna show you exactly, I'm gonna teach you how to do it. Right? I realize that this is something that my vantage point has been unique to the world and I decided two years ago that Note School was going to have excessive high level training on creative finance in this area and this has been a mission. I've woke up every day with it on my mind. I've taught a lot of people to do a lot of different things with notes but this is something I've added that I, I see a significant impact. So let me ask you a question. You want to be this guy or this guy? Huh? Because the reality is, is that you're going to hear people that say, you can't do this. Ah, this is impossible. This can't be done. So I would say with a lot of confidence that I have dealt with some of the top attorneys and accountants and compliance people in the United States. Don't let somebody tell you you can't do this, right? This is absolutely something that you can do and don't let somebody rob you from money that you need to be making. So all the naysayers in the world, all the, we all have relatives that say, ah, oh, you can't, that's impossible, you can't do that. And I'm just telling you right now, from a, from a guy that grew up a cattle auction barn in Jackson, Mississippi with dyslexia, if it's I can do this, you can do it, right? So the answer is, one of the greatest things about this business is you can be happy and you can create legacy. So one of the important things about this business is it moves you out of just transactional income. Transactional income won't be good to you a long time in the future. Creating a long-term cash flow will be good to you a long time in the future. It will allow you to start building things like legacy, which is really what Note School is really about showing people how to, how to grow wealth long term, not just make money today. Although, we show people how to make money today as well. So, once you see it, you'll know how you're going to be simple, you're going to be passing up, you're not going to be passing up properties that all the other real estate investors in town are passing up. And then secondly, you're going to profit today and over time, long term, Residual income is a super, super important part of this. Now, we could do all the speaker games and raise your hand and shrub your head. And let me just tell you something. I know what you're thinking. You're saying I can make the same income I'm making today on a deal and create 30-year cash flow? That's exactly what I'm saying. You could make the same relevant transactional income you can from wholesaling a house on a deal that you couldn't wholesale, and you can create long-term wealth. This is why real estate investors add this to their business. So let's play a game. Look at these houses. What do you see? A lot of places, a lot of property types. Look at these. Any pattern to this? So the pattern in every one of these houses is that the pop quiz is this. They all paid retail and profited. They all used creative financing and profited. And they all double their profits at least versus a wholesale deal. So A, B, or C, or D. The answer is all the above. So this is what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to show you two case studies. I'm going to show you two different deals of 500 I could show you. But I'm just going to, I'm going to, we're going to crack the tip of the iceberg tonight and kind of build in your mind what's possible, what you could have been missing, what you haven't thought about that you could. So... Three promises I'll make to you. Do deals that others investors pass. You can make money today and tomorrow, and it will work anywhere. So I was just telling Brian before we started tonight. So I have a case study tonight about a guy that lives in California. So it works in California. It works in New York. 
It works in Denver. It works in Birmingham. It works in Dallas. There's not a market that'll work. Now, I'm going to tell you one thing that's important and what most of you, if you've ever heard anything about seller financing, is that you've been sort of taught seller financing is selling a junky house to a junky buyer, right? It's kind of selling a substandard property to a substandard buyer, and that's why they do it. Nobody would make a loan on the house, and nobody would make a loan to that guy. That is not what Eddie Speed teaches, right? I teach you to build a portfolio, and that means you get paid. So I teach you how to buy a good property, and because of the way you structure the deal, that it will ensure that you can find a good buyer and it will ensure that you can get a payment for a long time in the future. So I'm not Mr. Ghetto Land. That's not, this is not, this is not what I teach. I have bought 40,000 notes. I bought 1,000 portfolios of seller finance notes. Lord knows I've looked at 6,000 seller finance, portfolios of seller finance notes. Yes, I've been to Birmingham before. This ain't my first rodeo, right? I've been in Birmingham where I didn't want to stop at the stop sign. Right? I just slowed down enough to make sure there wasn't another car coming. That was plenty stopped enough. Everybody been in that neighborhood? I've been there, baby. So I know what, I know what people have in their mind. This is not what we teach. This is, this is structuring financing that allows you to deal in a superior product to how no, most people look at seller financing. So, who is that guy? Huh? Who is that guy? He's an actor named Brad Pitt. And he is starring in a movie that I love this movie. The movie is about a business model. It's not really a baseball movie. It's a movie about a guy that had a business model he applied to a baseball team. The movie is called Moneyball. If you haven't seen it, it's a great movie. And by the way, they all thought he was crazy. The manager of the Oakland A's was a guy named Billy Bean. And he had a financial model that he could apply to baseball that nobody had ever seen. And he went from midway through the season of having the worst team in baseball to winning the World Series with the second lowest team in baseball. You see, he looked at baseball through a, sep a different set of eyes. And so one night, I was kind of thrashing thinking about this and explaining to somebody, what is it that we do? 45 minutes into this late night movie, I started realizing this is what we do. We teach real estate money ball. That's what we teach. We teach people to look at a deal through a separate set of eyes. Now I've already said a couple of shocking statements and that is price doesn't matter, which makes me sound kind of like a nut, right? Here's why. Because we're going to teach you to be a deal architect. How do you turn a deal upside down and find an opportunity in it when buy low, sell high doesn't work? What happens when buy low, sell high doesn't work? Because that's the market condition. We're in the most competitive, wholesaler, fix and flip market we've ever seen in our lives, right? There's, there's more people chasing a customer than there's ever been before, and the customer is more confident that they can sell their property to a real estate investor than they've ever been. And they essentially create a bidding war, right? It's a market condition. How do you beat your competition? And that is get yourself in a position to look through a real estate deal through a different set of eyes. So, how do you usually make money? How, how is money made? How do, what, what, what makes an entrepreneur? You're a problem solver. A problem solver is everything. If you can solve a problem your competition can't solve, your customer will do business with you and they won't with your, with your competition. So tonight, we're going to solve a problem, and that is price. Okay. Most competitive market I've ever seen in real estate investing, and I've dealt with thousands of real estate investors 
over my career. I've never seen anything like it. I hear everybody laugh and tells me the story every day that they walk out of a house to go talk to a customer about buying their property so they can wholesale it. And when they're walking back out the door, they high five the next wholesaler walking in the door, right? It's kind of like that. So with that is this, the elephant in the middle of the room, competition and lost leads. This is a market condition. I don't need to come explain it to you. You obviously know the market condition. So with that market condition, then thank you very much. So with that market condition, this is what you find. You have one cash sale out of 20. You make 20 offers. You get one customer that says yes and 20 customers that say what? They say no, right? Now you say, well, how do you come up with that number? Well, I coach and train top 200, the top 500 real estate investors in the business. They're the ones that give me that number. So if it's a bad number, I'm sorry. I'm just dealing with some experts that give me a true, true number of where it is. If that's true, then let me ask you a question. Is there not a deal in the middle of any of those 19 left? There's 20 squares up there. Is there not a deal in the middle of any of those 19 left that you didn't close? If there is, the strategy you use is what I teach. So I believe that you can get a second yes, and yes, I think it's possible to get a third yes. Now that may be a stretch on number three, but if I can show you to get one more yes, you close one on your typical wholesale strategy and do not stop, do exactly what you're doing. But number two, you close a second deal on a term strategy and all of a sudden, what happened to your conversion rate? What happened to your closing ratio? You doubled it. So here is a price scale, right? Here's 100% and down to zero. Here's you and here's your customer. And you want this. What does your customer want? About 5% of the time they'll say yes to that, and your customer wants that. Your customer wants to sell their house at what? At no discount. So if that's the case, you're hearing a no 95% of the time. If we can fix that problem, a little bit of the 19 that say no, we just shot, solved a giant real estate problem. Same transactional money up front, except there's cash flow for a long time in the future, right? I'm not trying to take you out of what you're successful at. We're just trying to change the percentage you're successful at. Now, I get to hang out with a lot of advanced real estate investors all the time, and there's two sayings that I know you've heard because I hear it every day with real estate investors. Eddie, I'm focused. I'm focused. I'm so focused, I can't change my focus. Okay. But the other saying that they say all the time is they got to get all the juice out of the lemon. They got to squeeze all the juice out of the lemon. And somebody that is so focused that they have one strategy to buy houses, they're so focused, they're leaving most of the juice in the lemon. It's a fact. So is it that hard to add this to your business? Nobody will deny it's profitability. Nobody will deny you can close more deals. So my job is to show you how you could literally add this to your business and the numbers will take care of themselves. So here's a squeeze of the lemon. And here's a lemon that's got all the juice out of it because it used an extractor. The amount of juice in that lemon, well, in a large lemon it says it's three tablespoons. In a medium lemon it says it's two. One squeeze isn't going to get you that much juice. Am I right? So this is a real estate investor expression they use all the time. We got to get the juice out of the lemon. That's what this does, right? Focusing is buying residential properties, meaning that you're not 
residential property and selling Amway and used cars, that's what I believe that the market means by focused. It doesn't mean that you're a convenience store that only sells water, right? So this is what I believe is like when you can do this and when you can add this to your business, you change it. So there's two forms of wholesaling. There's wholesaling price, and that is just what we've been talking about. You have a house that's worth 100, you pay 75, which means the house is discounted what? 25,000 bucks, right? Why will a wholesale deal not work? The customer won't accept your discount. The customer has low equity and cannot accept your discount. And the third reason, the property has a weird factor to it and a real wholesale deal doesn't work. Does anybody know why wholesaling has become such a thing? In 40 years in this business, all wholesaling has really only been a thing for about five or six years. Anybody know what caused that? Why, why it changed? Why this became the thing? TV. HGTV, baby. Who are you? If you're wholesaling deals, if you're wholesaling deals and the wholesaler is letting you make twenty-five and thirty thousand bucks, you're selling to a newbie. The old dogs in this room aren't consistently going to let a wholesaler make that kind of money. Wholesaling, the average profit used to be three, four, five thousand bucks max for a long time, for as long as I've been doing it. Now all of a sudden, enter HGTV house buyers. This is what made wholesaling a thing, right? And because of that, then all of a sudden, you have this property type scenario. And honestly, sometimes a property doesn't fit a wholesaler. Sometimes it's just a better deal to sell it to an owner occupant than to sell it to an investor. So I don't, I'm not making fun of the HGTV buyer. In fact, I make a living with the HGTV buyer because he finances my bank. So I'll show you as you progress in note school how to make profit and off, offer HGTV buyers something other than a weekend job of rehabbing houses. Trust me, it's very, very lucrative to understand how to go position an audience that there's a second thing they can do with their business. Okay. So if this is half the equation, what's the other half of the equation? If there's wholesale price, what else could there be wholesale? Terms. terms. So wholesale terms is paying for their equity and future payments and financing terms that a bank wouldn't agree to. Because people are willing to carry financing for you that a bank or a mortgage company would never agree to those terms, but an individual would yield because they are drunk on price. In fact, I'll tell you a little saying, but it's true. When they're too cheap to pay a real estate commission, I own them. When they're too cheap to pay a real estate commission, they're perfect because they are so drunk on the closing statement, so drunk on that first line, it says contract sales price, they will give the terms to me that will make it a killer deal. Because trust me, if you can pay with future dollars, you can make it a killer deal. So, here's a house with 100% Equity. They, they, they are, it's a hundred thousand dollar house. They, they, it's a free and clear. Now, now we teach this strategy in a multitude of property types, with a multitude from no debt to almost well, too much debt to buy it as a wholesale deal. But this is an example, and this is an example to get your mind working. So here's a hundred thousand dollar equity, and what do you have? You have a timeline, and you're paying them what they insist they want on the property but you're paying them for their equity in, in installments in the future. I can give you 100% of your equity, but what? I'm gonna pay you out in time. Now here's a better one. What if you did exactly the same thing, but you sawed down what your payment was in half, 
and you just extended the term in double. Now, I have a lot to say about interest related to these loans and how it's applied and how it can be structured. We're not going to ignore the elephant in the middle of the room. My focus is to teach you how to get the seller to carry terms as long as they'll carry them. I can show you how to do a replacement for no interest if they insist on interest. So there's a multitude of ways to structure these deals and how to work. So here's an example. It can be free and clear. It can be partly leveraged. It can be all leveraged. There's creative financing that can be structured around any one of these boxes. Any one of these boxes will allow you to do it. In fact, on Saturday, I'm going to do a case study of a deal that that customer had virtually no equity in. None. It was a VA loan. The house was worth $330 retail. They owed $323. My guy makes 17,000 profit up front and a check for $500 a month for 30 years. Would a wholesale offer have worked on that deal? No way. A realtor couldn't even sell it. So that you can do this on a variety of strategies. So tonight, we're gonna to take a couple of free and clear deals because they're the easiest for me to unpack the fastest, okay? So I'm going, to show, I'm going to show you a couple of deals, but people say, what are these terms? There's 50 different possible terms you could negotiate. I'm going to make a statement to you. We're going to teach you how to structure terms that are way better than any bank or mortgage company would ever agree to. So the pattern is I've learned they're willing to sell or finance, and they're willing to allow you, the buyer, the guy who owes the money, to dictate the terms. If you go to the bank... Who's going to dictate the terms? Bank. The bank. You go to an individual, who can dictate the terms? Investor. Yeah, the investor, the borrower. So here's some stats. We price about 3,000 one-off mom-and-pop seller finance notes a year. So we're in the note buying business. We've been in a long time. My executive team has bought $3 billion in owner finance notes. Fairly experienced, right? So we, we can take all of this experience and then we just look at kind of a quarter's worth of business and we just say, what do these notes look like? What, what characteristics do these loans have? So the loan sizes that we analyzed in a quarter's period was 25,000 to 1.2 million. The overall average interest rate was four and a half percent. Below market, one third of these loans were written at 3% interest and 15% were written at 0%. So uh, down payments, the down payments were one-third, had zero to 5000 down. One-third of almost $100 million in seller finance notes, one-third of that whole book of business was written at zero to 5000 down. You see, what I have to do is teach you what's okay with a seller, right? I've looked at hundreds of thousands of owner finance notes. I have learned the pattern, what's okay with them. If I teach you that, I can teach you what to negotiate for. And when you know, go, then, what, then when you know what you're negotiating for, you can make a deal. I was telling some friends at lunch, real estate investors, high volume guys here. I said, I meet even high volume real estate investors that don't know this game yet, and they don't know what they're negotiating for. Right? I teach people what to negotiate for and how to position it to where they get what they want. Once again, on the surface, I just look at it like this. If your real estate investor buddies don't want to put you in a straight jacket at some point because they think you've lost your mind, you're not doing this well enough. Because I've already said in the first 10 minutes that I said it tonight, price doesn't matter. And you're always sitting there going, what the heck? Right? This is a different way of looking at deals. But when you get this, you can close the deals. Your competition can't close. And by the way, you can go take their dead, dead leads from your competition and go work them and give them a bird dog fee if you close. They got a trash can full of problems they can't fix. So all of these are variables. I will say always agree. They'll always agree to terms the bank won't. Okay, so here's a... Here's a guy in California. I'm going to do a case study about him tonight. He bought 180 houses last year. His name is Seth Choate. 
He lives in Oakdale, California. Okay, so it's about uh, an hour in from the Bay Area, San Jose, the, the Silicon Valley. And uh, nice guy, he's got a little baby, pretty wife, and they're just changed their whole business. So I want you to read this. Just read this statement. Is this possible? Is that possible? Could you make $288,000 profit over 10 years on a deal that was full retail? Is that possible? It is if you understand creative finance. So here's the deal. This is not a brand new slick house, but it is in Oakdale, California. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not like it's falling in. It's dated, but it's not, it's, it's, it's not bad. There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a main house, there's a mother-in-law house, there's a barn and a couple of acres. And where they live in California, this is a $450,000 house. The guy that owns it is 79 years old. Just, just think about this guy, because we all know who he is, right? He's 79 years old. He married a younger woman. She's 69. Okay? He is not going to discount. Period. So every wholesaler in town is done. There's no chance. There's no way to make a deal work. Seth called me with this deal. I said, it's perfect. It's perfect. I said, he's already walled off your competition. I said, now you can have FaceTime with him and you can make the deal work. Because Seth already said, I can, I can meet your price requirements. I'm going to need you to work with me on the terms. I can meet your price requirements. So this is the property. And... Uh, this is where we all live in the business, and it's stuck on price. The seller says, I want $450. A wholesaler would pay $375. Down payment, he's willing to sell it with $50,000 down. He's okay with seller financing, and he says, I want a 10-year term. Now, I have a lot to say about any one of these variables, so you just have to understand this is a, this is a case study about a deal. Don't freak out about the 50,000 down. Because trust me, I could have just as easily showed Seth how to buy this for absolutely no money down. He chose on this case study not to do it. But I'm going to have some case studies that I'm going to be able to show you over time that he absolutely bought it with nothing down. In fact, I have a training called the Nothing Down Deal Architect. So there's a lot, most of the ways you structure this is not your down payment. The seller, yes, he would have gotten $50,000 in the closing, but that would have been a private lender's money, not my money. Right? So there's all kind of ways to paper and structure these deals. So here's where we're at. Here's the price, and here's what the customer wants. And this is the world of wholesaling and fix and flipping. Am I right? You, they got a number, and you got a number. You just ain't on the same number. Right? So... In that process, Seth says, I'll do exactly what you want. You'll get $50,000 a day, and you'll get $400,000 tomorrow. Guy says, okay. I can live with that. So here's how he structured it. He structured it at no interest, which I'm not saying will always work, but always try. And he did it. So he bought it at no interest amortized over 30 years with a 10-year balloon. So there's the payment. So Seth owns this house. He controls this deal for a debt service of 1100 bucks a month. Think you could figure out a way to make money with that? If you had a $450,000 piece of property and your debt service was $1,100, could, could you figure out a way to make some cash flow out of this deal? So, so I'm not absolutely adamant that you sell or finance and resell it on a wrap, but I'm going to say to you that a lot of times that's going to be the best strategy, and I believe in this strategy it was the best strategy. So this is how we bought it. And uh, so there's the seller. He conveys ownership to Seth, the buyer. I guess Seth's wearing a skirt tonight. <laughs> Seth signs a note. Who holds the note? The seller of the property. 
Seth is the borrower. The owner of that note is the guy who sold it. So what does Seth do every month? He makes a payment to the owner of the note. The seller is his bank. Okay? So it's a, the seller finances the equity, and the seller has an absolute mortgage against it. Now, let me just tell you something. We baked about 25 conditions in this mortgage that a bank wouldn't have agreed to. Okay? So don't think that the, a deed of trust or a mortgage is a generic document. It all has to have the same thing in it. You, you don't get what you deserve. You get what? what you negotiate, right? So we baked in a lot of very clever documents. This is absolutely a foreclosable lien. So the old man's not being cheated. He has a foreclosable lien. But he's agreed to a lot of stuff that a bank or mortgage company wouldn't have agreed to. It could give Seth future advantage in the future. We don't have time to get into all those details tonight, but let me just tell you, this is part of the formula. It's not just zero interest. Right? It's not just zero interest. So the house is mortgaged. So this is Seth's buy, just like we talked about, and then Seth resells it. He doesn't oversell it, but I would say he sells it at top of the market. Not, not oversold it. So he sells it for $475. He gets $75,000 down, which is less than 20% down, to what I call a penalty box buyer. This guy does not have bad credit. This guy is not, this, this guy has good money. He has good credit. He's self-employed, right? It's not that he has a problem and he has got a bunch of injured credit and his brother-in-law won't loan him money. He's not that guy, okay? He's just not bankable. Then Seth has a rap note for 400,000. Seth, Seth owes 400,000 and Seth is owed 400,000. Now you're saying, well, that's about break even. Huh, wait. So if Seth makes 25,000 on this at the time of the resale, which was a short cycle, that was profit at closing. And then so Seth, now, now the diagram ch changes. We've got the seller and the real estate investor, and we got the penalty box buyer. So the penalty box buyer gets a deed to the property. He signs a wrap note to Seth. So Seth is collecting the gross payment, and it's a wrap note. So he gets a bigger payment, and what does he do? He makes a smaller payment to the guy with the underlying lien. How many of you are familiar with an Airbnb? Right? Pretty common? Do you have to own an Airbnb to operate an Airbnb model? Oh, you don't? You mean you could just have a lease on it? That the lease allows you to sublease it on Airbnb? You're saying that you could do that? So what happens every month on your Airbnb deal, right? You have a, you have a small payment going your, to, your, to your landlord, and then what do you receive every month? Over a period of a month, you receive a much bigger check from Airbnb. Just That's what a wrap note is, right? You're obligated to pay your underlying mortgage, but you can do what? You can collect a bigger payment than you're receiving. So Seth sells it at 7% interest, which makes a 30-year AM $2,661 a month. What's his, what's his underlying payment? It's $1,100. So there's his cash flow. He mirrors the term, so he puts a 120-year balloon on it. And anything past eight years, you're not going to have problems with Dodd-Frank putting a balloon on it. So we vetted all that. He should be totally fine with putting a balloon on it. So now Seth has created a transaction. In 10 years, he's got to pay off his mortgage. And where is he going to get that money from? From this guy that's going to be able to pay him off. Okay? So here's the buy. Here's the sale. So that is, if you want to get a picture, that's a pretty solid picture of like getting, like that, that pretty much paints the story of the deal. He's going to make $25,000 at the resale. He, he, he had $50,000 in the bank. He didn't need to structure a, a temporary private mortgage, private note to do it, but 
a lot of students will typically do that. Seth just didn't do it, so I'm not going to make that part of the case study because that's not what happened. But most students will do something kind of like that. So the income on it is that's the, that's the payment he's receiving, and this is the payment he owes. And so you analyze that. This is an $18,600 cash flow per year. How long does it last? Last 10 years. And then we got to pay off the balloons. By the way, the difference between a 0% amortization and a 7% amortization, there's some really good juice on the payoff. Seth has a lot more equity in the deal at the end than he started with because his loan is going straight to the principal, even at a lower payment, and he's being paid on an amortizing loan. So he's got some juice at the end. So here's the... Here's Seth's underlying payment. Here's what he's receiving. So what has to happen every month, right? So every month, the payment has got to, we got to clear and pay the underlying mortgage. And this gives him a net payment every month for how long? The life of the loan, okay? Now I mentioned the amortization. So this is just a picture of a graft in Excel. This is just a picture of a graft. And what we told Excel to do is show a picture of an amortization schedule. The green is the amortization schedule that Seth had owed. And at the end of 10 years, the buyer still owes of his original 450, he st or excuse me, 400, he still, still owes 343,000 bucks. But Seth is paying how much interest? Zero. So his payoff is 266, which means at the balloon, he's going to end up with 76,000 at the balloon. All right? So... I made a bold statement at the beginning of this case study. I said a guy could make $288,000 profit. Well, it's almost that. It's about 400 bucks short. Okay? So every month, Seth gets, he, at the closing, he got 25, and every year after that, he gets the cash flow. First year, 43, and then it just continues at $18,600 a month. And you do that over the life of the investment. And then as you progress down the road, at the end of 10 years, what's going to happen? He's gone the 10th year, he's going to earn his year's worth of cash flow plus what? The difference in the payoffs. You tally all of those numbers up, it's 287583 bucks on a deal that he paid full retail for. And I can show you case study after case study after case study that this is what creative financing is. Is buy low, sell high the only way you can make money? I'm just asking you. Is it? Is buy low, sell high the only way you can make money? Not if you're a deal architect. All right. What most real estate investors are passing up are deals that they're stuck on price. Most real estate investors are passing up deals because they make an offer, their customer wants a different offer, and that's where they're stuck. That's why the conversion rate in this business is shrinking. There's more competition. There's, it doesn't mean that you stop wholesaling. That's not what we're saying. You continue to do exactly what you're doing well. I'm just saying, let's go on and get the juice out of the lemon. You've already paid for the marketing. You've already spent the time. You've already done. You already got yourself right up to the, the time the ball game starts. Don't leave. Right? So closing more deals is absolutely a factor. So let's look at a second one. So this guy is in a hyper, hyper competitive market. It's called Seattle, Washington. Okay? Hyper competitive. Right? I see him, I trained, this, I trained this young man for several years. He did well, he left his company job, he's, got, he's a full-time employee, or not a full-time employee anymore, and now he's self-employed. I see him at an event and he says, Eddie, I'm doing great, thank you. Best news I've ever had. I said, what? He said, I'm getting married. I'm like, awesome. He said, but bad news is, one little bad thing is I would, not, I don't want to move in a rent house. He said, I would like to move in the house that my wife and I own. And he said, because I left my corporate job, I'm not bankable, and I can't do that. And I said, Kevin, that is the best thing that could have ever happened to you. You're not going to have a lender dictate the terms to you. 
And I told another friend of mine that today. I'm 60 years old. This cowboy ain't signed no big note at the bank because I don't have to. I know how to do it another way. I can, buy a, I, can bar, I can buy all the property in the world with no personal guarantee, no qualifications, none of the clauses that you sign in documents every day. This cowboy ain't signing no documents like that. I don't mean I never have. I just mean I don't have to. And when I got him in that in his head, then all of a sudden he goes, wow. Really? I said, dude, you can do this. Now, once again, I didn't really focus on this as note schools training until about two years ago. And the reason I did is because I hang around a bunch of hotshot real estate investors, ninjas, I call them. Ninjarias, right? They're all the guys that you, get, you see on the internet all the time. I mean, I, I, I'm in several masterminds with them, Investor Fuels, Collective Genius, Boardroom. I, I speak at all those places, right? So I'm around all these hotshots, and they started complaining about one problem, their margin and their conversions, really two problems. And I'm like, well, why don't you just, guys, why don't you just buy on terms? They're like, what? I'm like, why don't you just ignore price and buy on terms? They're like, what are you talking about? So this is what, this is what led me to really go develop this. My wife and I bought properties and ranches and houses and commercial built. We bought on terms. For our whole married life, we've been married 37 years. So this is something that was automatic to me. It was automatic thinking. I just realized it wasn't automatic thinking to others. So as a result of it, I made a significant shift and added this to what Note School really teaches because I realized that if I could solve this problem, every real estate investor could change their business. So... Kevin wants to buy this duplex. Now, I know we're in Birmingham, and I know this may not be the slickest duplex in Birmingham, but in Seattle, this is a $325,000 property. And it rents for $1,500 a side. Okay? It's, uh, if location matters, trust me, Seattle is a market condition. But he solved a problem, right? So he wanted to rent this side for $1,500, and what did he want to do to this side? He wanted to live in it. Right? He said, I want my mortgage payment to be paid for free. So this was wholesale, and this seller was out. They would not discount it. This was retail, and Kevin says, I can pay you exactly the price you want. Now, there's a dot, dot, dot behind that statement, right? What is the dot, dot, dot? So long as you can, long as you can work with me. So here's how it framed up. Wholesale was this. Kevin says, I've got some conditions. And the seller said, I've got some conditions. And this is exactly where you will live every day in this business. So Kevin's conditions were, he says, I only want to pay 5000 down. I have laughed and told Kevin that's what I call guilty money. He just felt guilty about buying it for nothing down, so he says, I'll put 5000 down. Because if the seller would have taken 5000 down, they'd have taken nothing down. So he came up with that number of 5000 God love him. The next thing is, he says, I want $100 to go towards taxes and insurance. My maximum payment is 1400 bucks. So my debt service on this deal is $1,400, and he says, I want a 30-year term. The seller said, we insist on the price, and we insist on 5% interest. So what we're going to do now is we're going to back into that and figure out whether it'll work. Because when he called me with this deal, this is where he was stuck. So... This won't work. Kevin will not get off of his numbers, and the seller won't get off of his numbers. Now we got to figure out how to maneuver this deal. Okay? So, $325 was the price. How much did Kevin want to pay down? $5,000. How much would you finance? Huh? Right? Simple math, right? You'd finance $320. 
So if you take that rate and that payment in the 30-year term, what's going to be the payment? $1,717. Bucks. Kevin says, I'm not going to pay more than $1,400, and they're not going to accept less than 5%. <clears throat> I said, okay. So how do we fix it? How do I make your payment fourteen hundred? You, you know, it won't. It, you can make it interest only. It won't work. So you can't fix it. You can't fix it, huh? I, I, I've been doing this forty years. You can't fix this math unless you change something about it. You can't extend the term. You can Listen, the customer was stuck. This is where life will always get you in this business. The customer is stuck. The guy calls me and says, we're at an impasse. I'm not going to pay more, and they're not going to accept less. And Eddie, I don't think there's any way to fix this, but this is why I'm calling you. And this is what my life in this business looks like. Because people call me with a stuck factor all day long. So I want you to write this down. It's an air note. Because this is what I told him of how to solve the problem. An air note. Now, I made this up. You can't Google it. <laughs> I just made it up. Okay? It just sounded good to me at the moment. I said, Kevin, run some simple math and back into this. He said, okay. I got 5% interest. Let's just say my payment is five bucks less than $1,400 a month, 30 years. I said, how much could you finance? If you backed into it, how much could you finance? He said, $260,000. I said, well, you just solved your problem. He said, what? I said, you just solved your problem. He said, uh, no. He said, I've got a case of the shorts. I said, we'll do a second note that's an air note. He said, a what? I said, an air note. I'm southern and he's northern. I had to spell it for him because he couldn't understand I could make air like multisyllables. I said, do a zero, zero. Zero interest, zero payment due in 15 years. He lost his nerve, and he offered 10 years, and, if, and he said it exactly the how I told him to position it, and they never stuttered. Now, what do you think his argument was? What do you think I had to mentally prepare him for before he made this offer? You see, I can be a math nerd and whiteboard out anything I want to, but if you can't get somebody to sign along with you, you ain't got a deal. I guess y'all have read, and this week I, I signed a contract to, to be the host of The Tonight Show. Y'all seen that on social media this week? I signed a contract to be the host of The Tonight Show. Now, I ain't gotten CBS to sign it yet. This is, where, this is where the rubber meets the road in this business. You can math nerd it up and come up with all the numbers you want to, but if you can't get them to sign it, you ain't got a deal. So half of this is the talk off. Kevin kept saying, Eddie, they insisted, insisted, insisted on 5%. I said, Kevin, you are giving them 5%. The, mortgage, the primary mortgage you're signing is 5%. I said, they're only giving you no interest on a little piece of the deal. I said, most of the deal, they're getting exactly what they wanted. If Kevin, Kevin says, listen, if I call them with a reduced rate of like 3.75 or whatever the math needs to be to make it work, he said, the door is slammed. He said, I've already had the conversation. He said, we're done. I said, we're, we're going to give them 5%. We're going to give them exactly what they wanted. You're only getting a compromise on a little piece of it. Now, there is a reason that I tell you that story. Because I will tell you that I carve up every week 
for some of the biggest real estate investors in the business, these deals, a lot. And I will tell you, this is what I've learned. They're gonna have to give up something, but it's how you position to learn to do it, right? You know, people that are, can, use an amortization, can use a financial calculator can back into, well, let's just change this, or let's just alter this. But the, the art of this deal is positioning in a way that they're okay with it. And I knew that if I offered the deal and said, you're getting your 5%, we're not reducing your interest rate, you're only giving me a preve on a little bit of the deal to make it work for me. By the way, this was not a real estate secured second lane. It was just a second note. It was unsecured second note. Even more better, right? Now you're saying, how in the world would they agree to that? because he was gonna rehab the property and get a loan from the bank and be able to get more interest and make their collateral more valuable. And they said, okay. So these are two quick examples. I love teaching with case studies. And I got a lot of them, right? I love teaching with case studies because you start really, really, really remembering the deal. It's, I use a, the formulas within the case study which allow, you remember the shutters on the house and you remember it was in Seattle and you remember Kevin's story and you remember Seth's story. So these, this style of teaching is what's effective. And so most all the deals that we unpack will start out with a, something like this. On a weekly basis, we basically start out with a whiteboard and somebody will bring us a crazy real estate problem and they'll say, it'll start out with something like this. Eddie, how do I fix this? Right? Is this possible? This is what they want. This is what, I, this is what I'm thinking. I'm going to tell you this. I'm not a magic man. I cannot fix every deal. But I will tell you of the 19 no's that I see real estate investors get, we can structure terms that could make sense on six to eight of those 19 every time. I can't fix every real estate deal, but I'm telling you right now that we are walking away from an insane amount of money because we're just looking at buy low, sell high. And so that's why I perfected this, because real estate investors, their marketing cost and their energy and their business. And by the way, what happens when the customer doesn't accept your price? Do they still have the problem, right? So you're helping solve a problem for customers because when they don't accept your price, they didn't accept your price usually because of emotions. I have learned that half of the people that offer you a property have a money problem. And half of the people that offer you a property have a real estate problem. So I have learned that I can serve a big piece of the market where people don't necessarily have a desperate money problem. They have a desperate what? Real estate problem. And that's what we do. So... Um, one quick thing. Yes, we still teach seller financing. And I'll unpack this when I come see you on Saturday, so I'll slow it down. But I just want to give you some numbers that says it's worth learning. The guy on the left, he lives in what he calls the great state of Raleigh, right? The lady in the middle, she was a corporate lady getting on an airplane every Saturday flying around the world with two kids in elementary school. Her dad was an investor of ours. Her dad's name is Pete. He said, I want her to be able to pick those kids up from, from elementary school. So they do this business 100% virtually. He didn't buy any deals in Raleigh and she didn't buy any deals in Baltimore. So another cool thing about this business is you can do it absolutely virtually all over the country. So these are two case studies that they did. These are houses in Western Ohio and combined their total cost in these two assets was 111,174. They got a down payment of 33,625 and their total payback on these two assets is 380,000 bucks. Now I can show you a lot of ways to structure financing around all that cash flow so that 
You could, you could recover your investment and make some profit up front, make some cash flow, build long-term wealth. There's a lot of different things that we'll kind of unpack when you come see me on Saturday to look at this is what the note business is. I always start out with one basis in mind. I start out with a good property that a good person is willing to pay me back. Right? I don't start out with a junk property and an unqualified person and pray they're going to pay me back. Right? 40 years in this business has taught me better. So I believe that I'm, what I'm teaching you to do is basically build your own little bank. What does your bank do? They take your money and they give you little for it. And then what do they do? They turn around and relend your money to somebody else and they charge more for it. Now, if a bank can do it, can I do it too? That's what we teach people how to do, how to build your own little bank. You're just using your real estate investment business to build your bank. You're just using your real estate investment build business to build your bank. Doesn't stop you from your, your wholesaling business. It's just in addition to it. But the cool thing about this is not only upfront profit, but you get what? Cash flow, right? I don't know how many of you have been in the market for years and years, but I've been around this market a day or two. Let me just tell you something. If something, not, something doesn't happen well in this market, the guys that have the most stability, it's not equity, it's what? It's cash flow. Because you can live to fight another day. And so I love to teach this side of the business to somebody that's already got a successful business and then add this to it because that cash flow will be good to you. Mr. Bryan, uh, we are going to talk about the class. Let me ask you guys a question. You missed any deals? Can you look at a deal that you may have passed and you said, I could have done it if I would have had some of these ideas in my head? If you've closed every deal as possible, note school doesn't have a home for you, right? But we all know the truth, and that is... The more innovative we can think, the more deals we can close, and that's where I'm wanting to really expand your mind. I'm wanting to take your imagination to oh, what's next. So on Saturday, that's what we're going to do. We're just going to have more time. We're going to unpack it. I, like, I love teaching with case studies. Um, I, have an, I had an hour to unpack 68 slides, and I got through w with four minutes I ran over. Okay, so we've unpacked 68 slides in an hour, so I, it was in a position where we could really open it up and talk about things. But on Saturday, it will be different. We'll be in a position where we can whiteboard it a little bit, we can look at what happened and what else could happen and possibilities and start repositioning your mind and thinking what's possible. But this is what we do. We just teach a real estate investor how to look at a deal through a different set of lens than other people look to close the deals you're not closing. It doesn't le it, we're, not taking, we're not taking anything off the table of what you're doing now. We're just saying, let's look at the offers that you're not getting accepted and figuring out there's another way to do it. We'll definitely have deals with very, very, very high loan balances where virtually have, they have no equity. And we're also going to talk about some hybrids where they owe about half of what it's worth. So we'll show, that, we'll show you that this can work on a wide range of properties. These were the two quickest, easiest examples I could show you. And not having an underlying mortgage was kind of part of that process. So it let me just kind of unpack some different, different scenarios faster. Thank you.